Welcome everyone once again to the Berlin Functional Programming Group. This evening, I am delighted to introduce to you Oscar Wickstrom, who is going to be talking about his front-end functional testing library, Quickstrom, or Quick Quickstrom. Uh, this is an interesting topic for me because, as a uh, as an erstwhile, I should say, front-end developer, I always found the testing story to be a bit of a nightmare. So I'm quite interested to see what Oscar has come up with to make our lives better. Before we get to the talk, uh, if everybody in the meetup could just post to the chat where you're from, where are you right now? It's always fun to see where people are in the world, what kind of audience we have. Lots of Berlin people as usual. Okay, we have uh, oh, some Americans. Cool. Nice to see everybody. Brazil, great. Great, great, great. So I'm going to post some links into the chat as well. You can follow the Berlin Functional Programming Group on Twitter. We have a YouTube channel, and I'm recording this talk, and it will go on the channel afterward. We also have a channel on the FP chat Slack, and you can join it using the link that I just posted there. And finally, most importantly, please support the Berlin Functional Programming Group by purchasing one of these extremely attractive t-shirts. So we already know that functional programming itself is uh, pretty sexy on its own, but you throw Berlin into the mix, and now you have some serious uh, hipster street cred, Berlin Functional Programming Group. You want one of these t-shirts. Buy one today and uh, it will persuade me that I should keep organizing these talks. It's a lot of fun and I love doing it, but please help me pay for my Zoom bill. So uh, with that out of the way, Oscar, uh, how would you prefer to receive questions? Uh, just sort of as they come in or all at the end? Yeah, I'm not sure what you usually do, but... Uh, Most people sort of accept them as they come in, and I can keep an eye on the chat and just interrupt you when it's convenient, or if you prefer, we can wait until the end. Yeah, if you, if you collect them, and I'll try to pause every now and then, and we can... Yes, so anyone who has a question, please keep yourself... Un, uh, sorry, keep yourself muted and type your question into the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat, and if I... Um, see an opportunity, I will interrupt Oscar, and I will invite you to unmute to ask your question, or if you can't or don't want to unmute, I can ask your question for you. Hope that works for everybody. And I will now hand it over to Oscar. Oscar, thank you very much for joining us. I think this is the first time that you'll be discussing your new library uh, publicly, right? Yeah. Cool. True. The, uh, the floor is yours. Let me share my screen then. Okay, and you can see the slides. Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, all right. <clears throat> so uh, today I'm gonna present to you uh, this, this new tool called Quickstrom. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the name later, I guess. But uh, this is uh, uh, very exciting for me to, to give the first uh, talk on this subject. Uh, so Quickstrom is a, a autonomous browser testing tool, uh, which basically means that uh, instead of like you do with Selenium tests or uh, you know Puppeteer is one tool, there's also one called uh, Cypress, a bunch of these uh, browser testing tools. Um, in these tools, you uh, you write tests as like examples or uh, scenarios. But in, in this tool, instead, you write specifications that are general. And then Quickstrom uh, can, can test your application for you based on that specification. That's the idea. And also, it can test anything, really, that renders to the DOM, or the document object model in a web browser. So it doesn't matter if, if you write your applications with uh, like a, a single page framework, like React or uh, Angular or whatever. If you do server-side rendering, like a uh, you know the, the old MVC frameworks or Rails or something like that, 
or if you do static web pages, doesn't matter. As long as something is in the DOM that carries some sort of meaning that you can extract, then you're good to go. And uh, Quickstream then also uses the DOM to explore your application sort of on its own uh, and then finds invalid behaviors or invalid states uh, based on your specification. So this is the, the high level idea. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about the background of this project, why I started it, and how it came to be what it is today. Uh, I'll show some results from uh, testing to do MVC applications. There are a bunch of implementations that I've used uh, to sort of test Quickstrom on its own. Uh, we'll talk about the specification language and how you use that to check web applications, uh, look at some code. I'll discuss some of the, the possible sort of future work that can be done in this area. And uh, then we can do, I, I've written Q&A here. We, we will take the questions as they come in. But uh, if we have some something that takes more time, we can perhaps wait till the end and uh, look at that stuff later. So, uh, OK. So for the background, um, this really starts with web development being a major interest of mine and uh, always having been sort of the focus. So uh, when I started programming, that was web development, like PHP and, and WordPress and good stuff. Uh, and also like web development is such a huge area and so many people in there and enormous, uh, enormous space to be in. So it's interesting to develop better tools, I think. And uh, again, like browser testing being sort of mostly based on uh, example-based tests or, or scenarios, I thought that maybe we could do something uh, a bit more like property-based testing. Which brings me to uh, the second interest of mine, which is property-based testing. And uh, for the last few years uh, or so, I've been uh, digging more and more into property-based testing. and. Uh, wrote a bunch of blog posts on this subject, uh, which turned into a short book called uh, Property-Based Testing in a Screencast Editor, which is sort of a collection of uh, case studies. Uh, I'll share a link to this book later on. And uh, if, you, if you get it today, you'll get it for, for just five bucks, actually five US dollars. There's a, a discount that ends today. Anyway. Um, when looking at property-based testing, I've uh, used state machine testing uh, quite a bit too, uh, both for UIs and for, for other components or systems under test. And when you do state machine testing in, in most of these frameworks that I've tried, uh, it takes quite a lot of effort to do that. And uh, you have to implement a lot of stuff. And Finally, and most, uh, the most painful aspect of it, in my opinion, is that you usually have to write this model that sort of, that is like a, a simplified version of the system you're testing. So it's, it's the Oracle. It says, if it behaves like the model, then it's correct, uh, which is fine for systems that are like inherently simple, conceptually simple. So a, a good example is uh, a key value store, a key value database. If you test a, uh, a key value database, or if you write a model for a key value uh, database, you can usually think of it as you know, just a hash map where you can assign values to, to, um, to names or keys. Uh, but under the hood in a distributed database, which has a sort of key value store semantics, then there's a lot of complexity. And this lends itself nicely to model-based testing. On the other hand, many systems are more like inherently complex. And to test them with a model, you would have to write a model that is sort of as complex as the system you're testing. So for instance, if you're testing, uh, I don't know, something that calculates taxes in Germany, then your model will be quite complicated. Uh, and maybe you have sort of implemented the system twice. So not great. And this is, of course, like a 
grayscale. Uh, but I find that it's not that often that model-based testing has this nice return on investment, so to speak. Finally, for like what what brought me here uh, is that I've looked in looked at the formal methods more and more, at least for for the last two years. Uh, I've been experimenting with languages and verification tools like F star. Uh, very, very, I'm, I'm very much a noob in this area and, and haven't done anything like serious, but it's been inspiring. Uh, also TLA plus and uh, followed, uh, you know, read uh, Hillel's book on, on TLA plus and tried to follow along with, uh, with that community and space. And uh, also been looking at uh, stuff like uh, temporal logic, which sort of got me to to this idea of mixing all these things together. So uh, the idea is, here was to uh, to use linear temporal logic, LTL, with some other learnings from these formal uh, methods and, and these tools, and apply that to browser testing, which when I started digging here, it turned out like, if you have a browser and you have the DOM, then you can automate a lot of the, the work or the boilerplate writing stuff that you have to do in, say, uh, property-based testing with models. So this, this makes it uh, like a lot less effort to, uh, to apply this, this idea to browser testing. And uh, then eventually, these tests will run sort of as property-based tests usually run in say quick check or something. So this is like a, a special case of property-based testing with models, you could say. Some benefits of this approach is that you, you get, well, many of the, the regular strengths of, of property-based testing, but uh, more specifically, uh, this lets you do less of that uh, boilerplate work and um, and like re-implementation work. And you can specify and understand your system and focus on that instead of uh, the, the extra effort. Another interesting aspect is that uh, you'll see this more in detail later, but Quickstrom knows about which element you're interested in in your specification and so on. And it uses some APIs in browsers to observe changes to the DOM. So you don't have to insert stuff like sleep or uh, await certain things, uh, which is regularly uh, shows up in, in like browser testing or UI testing. You have to guess some, you know, wait one second because then maybe that button is uh, available to click or something. But you don't have to do that. And finally, uh, given that you don't have to implement like a full model of your system, you can instead uh, implement properties or constraints or propositions that are what I like to call weak. I don't know if this is a good uh, like official term, but um, you can say stuff like, you, you don't have to be super specific and and say exactly how your system works in all cases. You can say things like, there should always be a back button to the homepage, or uh, uh, there should never be more than one, you know, active spinning loading indicator on the screen at, at any given moment. So you can have a uh, very, uh, like you don't have to specify much, but you can still catch some mistakes or, or bugs with those properties. So when you run, uh, run these tests, uh, I'll just give a, a quick overview. It sort of works like this. Uh, Quickstrom will navigate the browser to the ori origin page, which is the starting point. It will then be begin to record a trace and a trace is a sequence of states and actions. Uh, and in this, this is a loop that it goes through. So it will generate some random actions and it will pick one of those that are possible. So for instance, 
it will it won't try to click a button which is disabled it doesn't make sense so it tries to figure out if it's possible to perform this action and then it will perform that action it will record the state afterwards and then it will go around and, and loop here until it has uh, performed enough actions Finally, it will check if the behavior, which is the sequence of states that it recorded, uh, if that uh, behavior satisfies your specification. And if not, it will try to shrink that sequence of actions down and rerun those actions and uh, iterate until it finds like a minimal uh, failing sequence of actions and states. And this uh, shrinking process is currently always performed but it might become optional uh, in the future okay uh before we go to the the to do mbc showdown do we have any questions so far i haven't checked the chat maybe i should i see a question from alex if uh, alex would like to unmute and ask yeah, quick question. Uh, when it decides to terminate, what are the conditions? Because there is a Pep's first search, Brad's first search, when it basically stops. Okay, so um, do you mean uh, the search for, um, for, for the state state, space? For, for reachable states, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so far, it's it's entirely random and uh, it it doesn't try to like exhaust or measure the state space in any any way. It just um, it it has a limit on how many actions it will it will try to run uh, if it can run more actions. Okay. So it, it, it usually runs like one test with uh, ten actions and then one test with twenty actions and sort of increments uh, for how many tests you want. And uh, it for for now it's only random in its uh, selection of actions and it doesn't try to like search in a, in a specific way but uh i i can comment a bit more on that later okay. yeah good question um this is meant to be an alternative to writing a test that says go to this page click this button check to see if the state is what i expect after you click that button was the button clicked or not that kind of thing yeah that's amazing because so, these tests are extremely tedious to write yeah and, like and kind of brittle i find tedious to write first and foremost like you you have to come up with them and you have to sort of not be too biased and and just check the the comfortable stuff but also the uncomfortable stuff uh, but and then you have to maintain them uh, which is in itself uh, quite annoying and especially because if you as you said you have like selectors click this button do that uh, then you get more coupling to what are the selectors for those buttons and what's the structure of your, your application? Oh, yeah. the, the number of possible states kind of explodes. It sort of becomes impossible to really reliably test. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, this is also testing uh, in that it won't, for, for any you know, mildly complicated application, it, it has no chance of exhausting the state space and, and checking every every combination of or sequence of, of states but uh, you know given enough runs and and if you have decent coverage then you can catch catch some bugs and you can run some tests that you didn't think of and uh, yeah it, it will increase your your um, your confidence but you can't be sure basically yeah i mean generally find a bug in production and then add a test to cover that case yeah and if you could find that in CI instead, even if it's you know, an hour after you, you, you pushed uh, your commits, then might, that might be better than you know, your, your customers uh, finding it uh, a month later. You're a man of understatement, Oscar. That would totally be better. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, it might be better. You, you, need, you, need to hire, you need to hire a bombastic American to do your marketing for you. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yuri has a question. Yuri, why don't you unmute and ask your question, please? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm looking at it from a perspective of a tester. This, I'm, that's what I'm doing for a living. And uh, you're, make, you're, you're mentioning that basically it will, it will work that way that it, it will click on the button, for example, that uh, if it's not grayed out, that it makes sense, like logically, right? But mm -hmm. um, 
is there a way how to say to it like test the the, the negative scenarios that make sure that this cannot happen for example i mean the, the stupid solution will be like put the minus one into the field which cannot which which can uh, only accept the positive numbers or like only letters uh, and you put the uh, numbers inside them something like that yeah um so it it won't only try uh the, the positive cases or, or the, the like the, the happy happy paths it will try anything that it basically can with you know exception of it can try everything but uh if it's possible in the user interface to to click a button when you shouldn't do that for instance or if it's possible to enter minus 1 because you haven't put in, put the the you know appropriate uh, uh, the bounds on on the input or something like that. If that is possible, then it might try to do that, and then your specification should catch that afterwards. So it will try to do the the invalid behavior, perhaps, and then you have a specification saying that like uh, this sequence of states doesn't make sense, or we shouldn't have gone to a, you know an error page or a stack trace or something like this in after the state. So. Yeah, you, you, you can catch those as well. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks. And one, one more question from Evelyn. And I need to ask it myself. Evelyn's audio doesn't work. Mm. Does it save minimal traces to use for a baseline for regression testing? There's no like automatic export or anything like that. Uh, but I mean, one thing that I haven't added yet, but which you could add, which is not quite that, but um, if if you could rerun by passing the same seed, so all the pseudo uh, random generation of actions would be deterministic and be the same, then you could use that seed as a sort of regression test. But I guess what you're asking for is more like, can I sort of export this to a unit test that I could check into the code or something like that? Uh, and I don't have anything like that yet, but uh, that would probably be very valuable when you find these interesting cases then that you want to be sure that they are tested. So that's, that's a good idea. Okay, uh, Evelyn, uh, any follow up to that? Looks like maybe not. Okay, I hope I understood the question correctly. So. Okay, let's move on. Yep, I think we can move on. Yeah. So uh, early on in this project, I started testing. I wanted to have something, uh, you know, real to test, and not only my my uh, toy examples that I could come up with. So uh, and I started testing these to do MVC apps. I'm not sure if you've all seen the to do MVC project. This is pretty old project by now, which sort of rose from the, the myriad of front-end frameworks or MVC style or single page app frameworks for, for uh, web applications. Uh, and there's a lot of examples on it with different frameworks or combinations thereof. And uh, yeah, I, I thought that might be an interesting case study to, to try Quickstrom on. So pretty early, I started using that as a sort of my own benchmark. And I wrote this one a single specification for to do MVC apps, uh, which actually supports both the, the current, the new, and the legacy format. So they, they change at some point, the, the selectors and so on. And I uh, started checking some of these mainstream implementations. They have like React and Angular and so on, the big frameworks. And uh, I found some issues in, in a few of those and um, reported a, a GitHub issue. Uh, by the way, I'll post these uh, slides somewhere later on so you can you know, click the links. Um, and then uh, the next step when I got a bit further was to improve the specification to more accurately you know, you know, cover how to do MVC should work. And this is the sort of back and forth between testing out the, the application, like, using Quickstrom and testing the applications, um, testing the applications sort of manually or you know just trying them out uh, on my own, 
and reading their specification that they have, which is more like a, a prose specification in, in English about how certain features should work. And I think that specification is not uh, like entirely covering what's in those applications. And yeah, um, it's, it's sort of piecing together uh, these different things. That's what I use to, to, to write my specification for it. So it, it, I'm not certain that this is like what it should be, but it's something that fits with most of the applications. So I checked all the implementations of to MC that I could find, and I found that 37 of them passed, uh, and 12 of them failed with some problem, uh, and four was not testable at all. Like they had been taken down or something like that. And there's a blog post on, on my website uh, with the results from this experiment and uh, more details on like what problems I found. Uh, there were, uh, I can't remember really any good examples, but you can check that blog post out if you're interested. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if we don't have any more questions so far, we'll do the specification language part. So um, the specification language in, in the Quickstream is like where you, where you write how something should work, how your system should behave, or your web app should behave. And the specification language, the first version that, uh, the only version supported right now, which is the first version, uh, is, is based on pure script. Uh, th there are uh, several reasons for, for me choosing PureScript here, but uh, it makes sense for me to use a functional language and an expression-oriented instead of statement-oriented language. Uh, and I, I picked PureScript, uh, and I've extended PureScript with some operators uh, that I've blended from linear temporal logic. Uh, and uh, you can check out this paper here if you, this link here, if uh, you're interested in linear temporal logic and how it's applied on finite traces, which is what we have here. Uh, I have also extended PureScript with uh, a couple of DOM queries so that you can express what from the DOM you're interested in, in checking. Uh, Basing this on PureScript makes it possible to use some regular, uh, the, the regular PureScript packages, basically. And uh, by implementing the interpreter in Haskell, I could more easily extend the language with my customer operators, and I could build the FFI for these PureScript functions uh, or the packages um, in, in a somewhat straightforward manner. Uh, I'll discuss the, the Haskell interpreter a bit more later. Uh, so let's start with the, the linear temporal logic or those operators. So these are operators that are not normally found in, in PureScript, but uh, they are here and uh, they change what's known as the modality of a sub-expression. It sort of changes uh, where in the sequence of states a, an expression is evaluated. So there are three of these operators. They're called next, always, and until. Uh, the last one was added recently. Uh, next takes an expression that returns any value A, a value of any, any type A, and evaluates that expression in the next state. And you'll get back whatever it evaluated to. The always operator takes a Boolean expression specifically and evaluates it in the current and all subsequent states and checks that it's true at, at any point. So it's basically saying uh, this sub expression is always true from here on out. The until operator says that some expression is true until uh, the other expression becomes true. So you can say something like the button should be um, enabled until it's disabled. That's a silly example, but anyway. Okay. 
Uh, so furthermore, you have DOM queries. And there are two operators. One is called uh, query one and query all. These are analogous to uh, what you have in the browser in JavaScript uh, with, uh, you can, uh, there are two functions or methods called uh, query selector and query selector all. These are basically those. And they take as arguments one uh, CSS selector and also it takes a record of uh, these values that are called element state specifiers. Uh, and I'll show you a bunch of these soon, but basically Quickstrom doesn't, uh, if you query for say a paragraph or uh, input or something, it doesn't collect all the attributes and properties and, and so on from that element. It just collects the attributes or properties or CSS values, whatever, that you specify with element state specifiers. Okay, so uh, let's see some examples. Here, the first one, we do query all button. So we try to find all the buttons and then we pass in uh, a record with text content and disabled. So this is saying, give me all the buttons and for each button, give me the, uh, its text content and a, whether it's disabled or not. And just below, you see the type for that expression. So it's saying, okay, you'll get back an array of records with a text content, which is a string, and disabled, which is a bool. And in the second example, we do query one instead for an input, and we ask for its value. And then we get back a maybe uh, of a record where there is a value of, of type string. Okay, do we have any questions so far here? Because it's gonna get a bit more complicated soon. I'm just asking in the chat if there are any questions at this point, and I don't see any, but people could be typing. So I will stall for a few more seconds to give people a chance to type in a question if they have a question to ask, but I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, let's go on. Uh, the next thing you, you need to do uh, in, a, in a specification is, for now at least, you have to specify what's called actions. So we need to say which actions should Quickstrom try. And this could be stuff like, should it try to click buttons? Should it try to enter text in, in input fields or, or text areas? Or you know, should it try to reload the page or uh, go back and forth with the, within the history and so on? And, and uh, these actions, uh, it's basically a list of probabilities and action specifiers. And each probability is like a weight. So it's relative to the other actions. So if I, uh, you see the type there on the third line, array of tuple of int and action. So I, I give the tuple with like two and click and say uh, one, and uh, enter text, then it will, you know, it's, it's twice as likely that it will trick, click somewhere instead of try to enter text. This could be stuff like focusing input fields and a lot of stuff. Uh, and I've predefined some, some actions or collections of actions like uh, a foci, which is, you know, focus uh, different types of uh, elements and click, uh, which uh, clicks the, the things that can be clicked but you often need to be a bit more careful when you pick these, uh, these actions and their selectors and uh, also the weights. Because otherwise, as I said before, the, the search is, is random. So it might get stuck in, in places where you don't want it to get stuck. It, it might spend too much time in a certain corner of your application for some reason, and you want it to cover a broader uh, you know, get better coverage of, of your state space, then you might have to tweak these weights or the selectors or the actions. It might also be like, if you have a web page, you might have, you know, if, uh, often in, in web pages nowadays, you have like a little chat thing going on in, uh, in the bottom right corner. And you might not want to explore that too much. It, 
might not be interesting. So then you might need to tweak your selector so it won't click there, but click in the interesting part. Okay. So if we look a bit uh, at how like a, a specification is structured in the PureScript code, it looks sort of like this. You have a module, you can name it anything you like. Here it's called spec. You import the Quickstream library. Then you define the ready when, which is a CSS selector that says when an element matches this selector, uh, Quickstream is ready to start performing actions. We list the action specifiers, which is just clicks here. And finally, we give the proposition. This is where you sort of describe the correct behavior. And I've, I've added an expression here, which is sort of the, the canonical or the, the regular structure of a proposition where you specify a state machine. So here we say that and remember, like when this starts evaluating, we're in the first state. So we say, okay, initially it should be, uh, it, it should satisfy this initial predicate or this condition. And then always it should either perform transition one or perform transition two and so on. And transition here is like a state transition. So we're saying th this, is enough to specify a state machine. It says, where does the state machine start in what state and what are the transitions of the state machine? And a transition usually looks something like this, but more complicated. But here we have transition one and it says that something should equal foo in the current state. And in the next state, something should equal bar. So you could think of this sort of as two states, foo and bar, and an arrow between them in a state machine. So this is how you specify state machines, by uh, having these transition predicates, which use uh, next, the temporal operator, to describe both the current and the next state. That's a transition. And this is how the to-do MDC specification works. So if you want to study that, then you'll see this uh, all over the place. But you can also use operators like uh, until, and you don't have to do state machine specifications. You can have those specifications that are just like, uh, you know, there should always be a back button or something. But this is common, I would say. Uh, the, the specification language is based on pure script, which in this case means that you can use some pure script packages like the numbers package, the strings a package, and so on, arrays. These are very useful when you're writing specifications because you might do uh, like uh, check if a substring is in another string which you got from a query in the DOM. So you need the strings package to do that. Or you might need to uh, you know, manipulate uh, arrays or compare numbers or parse numbers. That's pretty common. Like you get most stuff from the DOM as text and you want to parse it into a pure script type that you can work with. You can do crazy stuff with transformers if you're into that kind of thing, or you know, data type generics and so on. This uh, is enabled because I've, I've built support for uh, a, a bunch of uh, packages in, in pure script and I've selected like these should be uh, supported. And I have to do this because the FFI of those packages is implemented in as Haskell functions. So if you want to support a new package, which has FFI definitions, then you have to build that FFI in Haskell and you know, do a bit of work. So it, it's quite hard, like hard coupled to Quickstream at the moment, uh, but this might change, I don't know. Okay. That's uh, all for the, the specification language so far. A lot of information there. I'm not sure it all makes sense without like uh, seeing full specifications and, and messing around with it. So understand if it can be a bit overwhelming and uh, uh, if there are any questions, just interrupt me. Uh, if not, I'll go on. To, I, think, uh, I think there's a question. Yep, cool. Uh, Andreas has a question which 
I have to ask, no microphone. Regarding the spec language being, quote, based on pure script, is the syntax valid pure script and or will editors complain? Uh, it is valid pure script and it's using the pure script compiler to do, so in, in pure script, uh, this is a bit detailed, but there is a representation of the AST called the, uh, the core functional language in pure script. And I'm using the pure script compiler to compile your specifications and all the packages to this core, core fin or whatever they call it, the core functional representation and loading that into the test runner. So it's regular pure script in that sense, but it's not compiling to JavaScript and it's not running like a Node.js runtime. Instead, I'm interpreting that core functional uh, representation in inside Quickstrom. So it's, it's basically like an in, in process interpreter there. Uh, but it means that you can use pure script uh, like language servers and editor tooling and uh, the automatic formatting. You get all the type errors from pure script. All the good stuff is there, um, except it, the runtime is different. Uh, thank you. And Joe has a question. Joe, go ahead and unmute. Hi, Oscar. Um, so you had a couple of examples of state transition operators in one of the previous slides. Um, and the, I guess mostly it was focused on going to some kind of next transition. Is there any way um, that you have currently implemented or have thought about notions of maybe encoding state transitions that depend on some previous state or depend on some other kind of, you know, it could be implemented as a, like a weird fixed point notion of trying to figure out how um, states should settle in some scenario where you don't just have this kind of A and then B uh, relation. Yeah, um, I haven't messed with it so much, but I think you can, like if you, uh, let's see, can you see my selection here? This expression, um, this evaluates to something. Now it's uh, now it evaluates to a to a, um, a boolean because I'm using equals here. But um, I could pull out the value out of this expression, get some something from from the the current state, and then I could base my predicate here on that value. So you could like sort of like monadically depend on on previous states uh, in your uh, in your uh, successive predicates, if, if that makes sense. What you can't do is that you cannot depend on values from, from uh, you cannot depend on values in your selectors and like state element state specifiers. So this isn't really monadic, it's more like applicative, uh, but it's not enforced with an applicative structure that you would find in in pure script or Haskell or something, it's it's more like built in into the interpretation of this pure script uh, language. So, to try to answer your question, yes, you could depend on, or you you could check values from from previous states in uh, in 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 next state predicates with some limitations. Does that make sense, or answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thanks very much. Okay. I think that's it for questions right now, if you'd like to move on. Yeah. Uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, okay, checking web apps. So um, we've, we've seen some of the language for, for writing specifications. Uh, bits and pieces, uh, yeah. But let's move on and see like how, how you actually run Quickstrom then. So. Uh, for now, it's a CLI application. And to run tests, you use the check command. You give it your specification, uh, the second argument here. And you give it the origin where it's supposed to start. And this can also be like a file URL. So if you test something that you have locally or, you know. Um, uh, the, the reason why you pass in the origin is that you might want to use the same specification for checking, you know, in your staging or development environment or locally as you do testing your production thing. Uh, there is a, 
bunch of options you can pass also, but I'll not go through those. Not so interesting. Uh, currently, uh, it supports running with two browsers or web driver or backends, really. Uh, it's Firefox with uh, its Gecko driver and uh, Chrome or Chromium with Chrome driver. And it's, it should be possible to support more browsers. I think Edge has some web driver support, Safari, um, Opera too, I think. So I, I've just not uh, added any, any way of, of support. Like, I think you can even hack around it, but it should be there. So you can run uh, with many types of browsers. One more uh, intricate uh, topic in, in QuickStream relates to this, which I mentioned before, that you don't have to wait or sleep, but uh, you still might have to think a bit about as asynchronous state changes. And uh, more generally, they're called trailing state changes in QuickStream. This is something I just made up. Uh, and the default behavior is, as we saw before, we record a single state change after each action. We try to record the state we're in after having performed the action. But you can specify, uh, or you, you can override it and say that you should also record trailing state changes. And this means that it will record the state right after the action, but also try to observe more state, state changes, which are not triggered by the, uh, or not uh, like a direct result of that action, but uh, it can be stuff like uh, usually asynchronous operations. So for instance, if the user click, clicks a button, there might show, uh, there might be like a loading indicator shown and it says, you know, fetching, fetching data or, getting your results or whatever, searching, you know, something like that. And then sometime later, you'll get the results. You'll get the search results or uh, the page you're looking for, whatever. Uh, and then you have one, uh, one like immediate state change for the, the loading indicator to show up. And then you have a trailing state change when the results come in or when uh, something failed and it will show you an error message. So then you, you'll have to say, or uh, to pass these options to QuickStream to say, you know, uh, try to find this many trailing state changes. It's called max trailing state changes and you pass it a number. And you also pass it a timeout or a number, number of milliseconds that it will uh, at most wait for until something happens. If something happens more quickly than that, it will pick it up immediately. But if nothing happens, it has to wait for some time. And this is something that you might have to tweak and fiddle with. So for instance, I was testing something for the, the tutorial in the documentation and which ends up using this. So if you go through the tutorial, uh, which I can recommend if you're interested because it's quite easy to get started, you just need Docker and you will be good to go. Uh, it ends up using these parameters because uh, there's a clock that ticks every second and that clock ticks even if you don't do anything. So uh, it, it had to pick up a number of trailing state changes and not only try to do actions all the time. So that's trailing state changes. And that sort of concludes the, the, the level of detail I want to go into so far. If, if you have any more questions or things that you want to look at or uh, have me show or explain in more detail, I can do that uh, afterwards maybe. Uh, maybe there's a question at this point. We can give people a few seconds if they want to type something into chat. I don't see any questions right now. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> then I'll just... Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. We have a question. Oh, we have one. From Alexander. And uh, again, I need to ask it. Is there any way in, in the specification to depend on actions? For example, if I want to check that a login modal only opens if a user clicks the login button, how would I find an error where it just opens at random? 
Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there is currently no way of specifying anything about the actions. So everything is currently about the state. And uh, I've thought a lot about this and uh, I haven't yet like found a good enough design on how to integrate the actions into this. Uh, but um, I'm still leaning towards it being useful. And as you say, like you might want to be a bit more specific about what action triggered a certain state change. And uh, so yeah, currently, no, you, you cannot do that. Uh, it might be supported in the future if I find some, some nice way of doing it. Okay, let's and uh, well, Evelyn has a comment. I'm looking forward to trying this out. Thank you so much, Oscar. That's nice. That's very cool. Uh, again, if you want to try this out, do check out the, the, the beginner tutorial. I, I can just, before we move on here. Did I? Uh, no, I didn't. I don't see the address bar, so I'm going to have to type back random here. Work? No. Okay, uh, I'll just show it quickly so you'll find it. If you go to this homepage, documentation, you'll end up here. And there's a tutorial here, writing your first specifications. This you can go through with just having Docker installed, basically. So start here if you want. Uh, yep, that's that. Oh. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap up a bit with like what I wanna do next with this. Some possible features that I might wanna implement here, uh, or this one is sort of guaranteed, always the case that you need better error messages and this is no exception. So especially, and one thing that I've found quite complicated to do is to show which state transition in a given behavior is the one that causes trouble. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't have an, any idea how, on like how to do that uh, in a good way yet. Let's see if I can find something. But I think this sort of relates to, if you know tools like uh, Prolog or logic programming with like search-based systems, or I think also like SAT solvers and those, when you don't get uh, you know, the answer, you get no. And this is sort of what you have here as well. You just get like, oh, a behavior and it's not correct. And it has like 120 actions or something. Like it could be really complicated. Usually the shrinking gets it down to something more minimal, but uh, might not always be the case. So it would be nice to pinpoint a bit like what state change, what transition, is not correct here. Uh, furthermore, for relating to our discussion about uh, searching the state space is coverage. So one thing is that I would like to report coverage for your specification. So if you write spe specification with like, oh, it should uh, either do transition one or transition two or three and so on, and you have a bunch of predicates in there, you wanna see like how often are these true or false? How is my spec being exercised basically? Uh, that would be very nice to debug uh, or to tweak your actions so that you can you know, manually tweak your actions so that your spec gets more coverage. This is the, the same sort of process that you go through in property-based testing when you tweak your generators to make sure you cover uh, the inputs that you want to test. But also with coverage, and this is more advanced and I, I've never built this before and it is just sort of a hunch, but I think that it might be possible to do something called targeted property-based testing or targeted search, where if Quickstrom knows that, okay, here's your specification, we have only achieved this and that coverage. We want to have more coverage in this area. Then, and we know like we have connections between these actions being taken and this part of the spec being uh, 
uh, being exercised, then maybe Quickstream can try to increase coverage for you by targeting the search and not being uh, just random. So that's something I would like to research more and let's see if I can see if I can build here. And then there are uh, fun things like uh, if you could detect unique states, you can maybe take screenshots and show like these are all the unique states we found in our application or something like that. Could be useful for just uh, you know visually inspecting. Uh, and then it might turn into a commer commercial product at some point. I'm not sure, but uh, the current version, the, the sort of core CLI test runner tool, this will be open source in its current form. Uh, I might decide to try to build like a, a service on top of it. And here you can build all, all sorts of fun stuff. Like you could have a, an IDE where you write your specs and get nice error reporting and you can run the specs from there. Um, you might be able to schedule stuff like nightly tests and uh, get reports or trigger by CI or builds in some way. Uh, integrate with the uh, browser stack maybe or these hosted web driver services so you don't have to set everything up your, on your own, uh, even if it's quite okay with Docker. And possibly support more specification language or different uh, differently support them somehow. So uh, it might make sense to, to support something like JavaScript or flavor of it at least, because if this is supposed to target web developers, then my, then maybe PureScript isn't the best choice from a, like an adoption point of view. Uh, it, it makes sense for me, like being an expression oriented language, it, it makes sense for like logical propositions, uh, but uh, there are other factors that play here. So maybe JavaScript or something else. And uh, yeah, if you want to check it out, uh, go to this website, quickstrom.io, or, uh, well, I, I think you're, uh, you might also want to um, sign up for this newsletter if you're interested. I post every now and then, not too much about what's going on. So that might be one way. You can also like follow me on Twitter. I usually post various stuff there. So the newsletter might be better if you're just interested in this stuff. Uh, yeah, and that is it. So if we have more questions or things you wanna look at, we can, can do that now, I think. Yeah, we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, first of all, uh, will you be able to share a link to your slides with us later? Hmm. And I can, I can post yeah. that um, on the YouTube video, on the meetup and on Twitter. Yeah, that sounds good. Also a link to your book. I found the book on LeanPub. Yeah, I, I, if you found it, then maybe you can post it as well, but I'll bring it up so you can see which one it is at least. Uh, I don't know the URL, it's, I don't know. Yes. Okay. Uh, it looks like it's why is this so slow? This is the one. Uh, there is uh, the discounted link. Maybe I should post. <clears throat> I could post that in the Meetup group and on Slack. Sure. Uh, and sure. You, can, you can use that. Then you only have to pay five. That's that's what I could not. That's what I could not find. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll post that and you can repost it where I yeah. asked. I'll be buying that immediately after this meetup is over. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. cool. Oh, no problem. I, I, I don't trying. want to plug this too much. But <laughs> no, plug interested. away. I plug my t-shirt. I mean, basically I'm running a t-shirt business here, but don't <laughs> buy my t-shirt, buy the book instead. I'm hugely supportive of developers writing books. Um, Maybe I should sell this design to you as, as a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, made, I've, I've actually made quite a few t-shirts, <laughs> so I could do that. Um, okay, cool. Shall we go to questions? Yeah. Aaron has a question or two. Uh, Aaron, would you like to unmute and ask your question or questions? Uh, yeah, I uh, was interested if, if this is a purely front-end library, like, or does it have to have a server component? 
server side component? Uh, it's it's based on web driver, so uh, it makes no it has no requirements on your web applications basically whatsoever. If if it if it works in a browser, then it works basically. So okay, yeah. So I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with web driver, but basically web driver is a way of remotely controlling web browsers, and uh, so. You can, you can think of this as Quickstrom as opening up a new browser, uh, visiting your uh, web page or whatever you have, the URL that you pass, and it will emulate the user clicking around and, and so on. So it's, uh, I'm, I hope I, I'm answering your, uh, your question. This is like Puppeteer? Yeah, I think Puppeteer is one of those, yeah. Puppeteer is based on Chrome. So it's yeah. doing the same thing, but specifically for Chrome. But basically, you you can test an HTML file, which is something I do a lot <laughs> for for testing this, and you can you can point it to a URL on the internet or whatever you want to test. Uh, so it's it's not at all coupled to what you built your application with. Thanks. Okay, and Aaron, you had said something about TypeScript as well, right? Yeah, I just was curious. Uh, you know, another guy asked about other language DSL and underscore and integration. Uh, TypeScript is what I use a lot instead of PureScript, so that would be handy. Yeah, I think like <clears throat> maybe JavaScript isn't the the choice I would make personally either. Like maybe TypeScript then, uh, but. Yeah, like if if I get one of those working, then it's not, I guess, too much work to get the other one working because it's the runtime that is complicated. Like, how do I make Node deal with the the states and the temporal operators and all that? So, I think once one is is figured out, the the other one comes pretty naturally. Uh, once you have JavaScript, you can conquer the world. <laughs> I guess so. Next question is from a uh, recent uh, Meetup contributor, Torsten. Okay. Hey, Oscar. Uh, this was more like a comment rather than a question. Um, I just stumbled some time ago of a paper called, uh, should we look it up, um, Branching Processes for Quick Check Generators. Uh, the, the topic is only tangentially related to what you're doing, but when I heard about you looking into targeted search and also this, this balancing problems, like that you have to basically fine tune these probabilities to achieve what you want, I, I was reminded by this work, maybe have a look, because what they're doing, they're, they're using um, a bit of math to, to basically automatically derive the right proportions with which you have to sample in order to get a good result, even like for complicated situations. So maybe have a look at this paper. I think I might have been at a talk. I'm not sure if it was based on that paper, but this was uh, in, in Gothenburg at Chalmers. There yes, exactly. Was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a library called Dragon that does that. Yeah, Dragon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, that certainly, I haven't really thought about that paper, so it was good if you reminded me about it, because that that is definitely related to that. Uh, getting that stuff right. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Very nice. Thank you. And Alex has another question. Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, you saw this broken to do MVC examples. Uh, and I wonder, have you considered whether it's possible to, like, implement this to do MVC, for example, applications in such a way that this illegal state states can be just unrepresentable, basically by making a constructive proof that your application is not able to reach uh, invalid state. Yeah, I, th that's not really like, you know, my, my strong area. So I, I can say with any, uh, any certainty, but uh, I guess that would be rather complicated. You could probably do it given enough effort, but um, I mean, the for this specification, 
uh, or f for that to be like useful, you have to be rather specific about what is the correctness of, of this application. Um, but uh, it might be possible. I, I, I can't say too much about it, really. Thanks. But, but, but I guess you could, if you, like you could use a similar specification as I've written in for Quickstrom for, for testing it to, to use as a specification in proving something is correct. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I mean, sim simple example, for example, login button shouldn't be visible on any page other than login page, right? Uh, you yeah. can construct a type of login button provided you use a sufficiently sophisticated language in such a way that login button can't be used on any other page. You just can't put it because compiler gives you type check error. Yeah. So this yeah, button probably. is not applicable anyway. That's yeah, I haven't seen anyone doing anything like that with to do MSC. I it's like <laughs> a, a regular uh, canonical example for for uh, approving programs, right? But uh, might be <laughs> if you saw the Hillel had this. He started this initiative with uh, proving left pad. I'm sure if you saw that. <laughs> no, I so they they take uh, take the the left pad function that famously. Uh, you know, went away, and uh, and uh, I, I, what did it like proved it in in a bunch of uh, different languages. So uh, stuff like TLA plus or uh, Liquid Haskell and so on. But yeah, again, that that's like I'm I'm not very knowledgeable in that area. So yeah. Do we have any more questions? I don't see any other questions. Uh, you did get a comment. Great talk. Thank you, Oscar from Abby. Thank you very much. Yeah, and other, other um, compliments coming in as well. Very cool. So uh, I, uh, if, uh, well, actually, um, does it make sense to do a demo of any kind? Is that something you're prepared for or would it not make sense to you? I haven't specifically prepared for it, but I guess we could do something. Um, I mean, if you're comfortable with it, it's not it's totally we, we necessary. If, it's always fun though. Know. Yeah, I guess it is. So if I mess up, we can cut it out afterwards. The dramatic tension of live coding. I'm all about okay. it. <laughs> Let's just first make sure that I'm not like on a weird branch breaking everything, no? That's good. And we'll see that. I mean, really, we just want to spy on your development environment. And okay. then someone, someone's inevitably going to ask you a question about Emacs or something. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yes. Here is a bunch of fun things that I need to think about quickly. But um, let's see. So you, can notice I haven't changed the name of my file system. It's already Tom. Uh, let's see here. Then you can see a bit what's going on under the hood. I'll, I'll first. Tom, Tom, like Tom, who shamefully isn't in the audience today. Ah, <laughs> I'm so disappointed. <laughs> Tom is the reason why it's called Quick Strum. By the way, it was called WebCheck before. Uh, friend, here. friend of the meetup, Tom Harding, who previously did a talk back in, uh, I think, May. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, let's see here. Chrome driver. There we go. Uh, so I'll start Chrome driver, which is a web driver server, which then will uh, launch and and control Chrome for us. Let's see if this starts. Yep. Cool. And then I have some command. We can perhaps tweak this later, but uh, specs other file upload. Is this a good one? Can't remember. Oh, no, it's probably not. All right. Um, 
can maybe do the to do MVC thing. I think it's around here. Here it is. Okay. Um, Move some of this stuff. Okay, so I'm running this through Cabal and some other options here. You can ignore those, but we'll pass the to do MVC specification. We can look at this later on too. Uh, and then we can pass a URL to, if we go to to mvc.com. And I am crossing my fingers that it just will work now. If we start with the old trusty Angular here, I just take this URL right here and see what happens, I guess. Spectacular failure, maybe. Let's see. It'd be safer to run this with Docker or something, but uh, let's try. And I'll pull up the spec in the meantime. Okay, let's see if it starts over here. Now oh, Cabal is doing stuff first. Um, maybe we can look at the spec for now. Why is this so slow? <laughs> it's trying to regenerate the index, great. Okay, it's gonna compile from scratch, great. Uh, anyway, let's look at the spec in the meantime. Uh, so this is, as we saw before, uh, a PureScript module. And uh, there's some complexity around like the old and new formats, but here we're using the class-based queries, which is the new format. And it starts when the new to-do input field is, is there. Uh, yep, and uh, let's see, the actions here are pretty more, like carefully constructed. So uh, I have a uh, like focus things that can happen. Uh, it can click certain things or it can press keys on the keyboard. And the clicks are here and then we say like, uh, there's a five times higher probability or like a five versus one, one, one. So it's five out of eight, basically, that uh, it will click the not selected, uh, a filter that is not selected yet. So if you look at, I can show you in the browser, if I write some stuff here, there are different filters in Todo MVC. So I click those, and which will change whatever is shown. And this is currently the selected one. And these are non-selected, so it will try more often to, you know, click the ones that are not selected than the one that is already selected. This can be clicked too, but nothing should happen, so it shouldn't spend time just sitting around clicking here. Uh, that's the kind of fiddling you might have to do. Uh, it also tries to like toggle all of them or destroy them, so you can here you can toggle all the items behaves differently depending on which state you're in or which filter is active so on and you can remove or like uh, delete those uh, let's see if it started running quite uh, the key presses uh, this is is something that is worth noting so I mean, if you have a text input, there are infinitely many things you can write in it. And it doesn't make sense to try to like exhaust that, that set of inputs that you could use. Uh, so you might just say like, okay, try pressing A for return, which, you know, press enter and you'll have a new to-do item. So uh, you can also say stuff like, you know, 
don't just press a key, but write this certain string. So you could have like, a, uh, I don't know, tuple five. I don't even know what it's called anymore, but like enter text, I think it's called. And you can say like, uh, you know, for bar something. But uh, this is something that you have to be careful with as well. Like you don't wanna spend too much time writing nonsense input because Quickstrom isn't good at validating, like checking that your data validation is correct. It's good at finding bad state transitions and like bugs in your, in your web app that are more like a bit higher level. But if you wanna test your input validation, you should probably do that with property-based tests on like a unit level, uh, unit test level. Then you can run uh, many, many more tests in a short amount of time and find actual bugs. Okay, it's finally started here after it's been building. So it will try first with 10 actions and that went fine. And then 20 actions. It will tick up like this for a while up to 100 actions, I think. Uh, and this is the Angular version, which I've boldly stated is broken. And here we have something. So now it will try to shrink down what it found. If we look at this, I don't know what's going on here. I'm getting a bunch of errors. Uh, if we look at this, uh, this um, trace we've got back, we have like 41 entries in it with actions and states. So it's, it's pretty long, it's a lot of stuff happening. Maybe there's a shorter behavior that still violates the specification. So it will try to shrink it down and that's what's going on right now. And it will uh, present us with the, the smallest one it could find. This is like the, what you find in, in most property-based test frameworks. Um, let's maybe look at the spec for it to take some time. Uh, here is maybe the, the most interesting part then. The, there's an initial state of to do MEC, and then there are a number of state transitions that are legal. So you can either enter text, this is when you write stuff, like one more character into the input field. You can add uh, a new to do based on what you've written. Uh, you can change filters, which I described before. Uh, you can mark one or check one as as completed or uncheck it so it's not completed or active. Uh, you can delete and you can toggle all items. This is what I've specified so far. So I've not specified that you can go in and edit items, uh, which you can in to do MVC or you're supposed to be able to do that. So this specification is not like fully, it's not complete but uh, it can find some stuff nonetheless. And then uh, another interesting aspect is that some, some of these uh, implementations didn't support filters or didn't even show any filters. So I've added uh, a predicate here, like an always, there should always be filters within the application. So you don't, you don't have to fit this sort of transition structure. You can have whatever, temporal uh, operators and predicates that you want to. So you can have like, this should always be true or this should be true until this other thing is true and so on. Okay, now it's completed uh, the shrinking process and we get back hopefully a small one. So it starts here in first state and then it will list like all the selectors that you are using and I, have in the, in the to-do MVC spec, there are a bunch of selectors for various things. And it will first give you all the, uh, the selectors and under each selector, it will, it's just a dash for now, it's a bit weird, but this is one element that matched that selector. This is another, this is another. And under each element, you'll see all of the element state things. So like properties or See if we have something else is done here. No, oh, it's only properties in these, but it says like the text content of this element was all, the text content of the other element was active and so on. So these are the filter buttons. 
uh, or anchors. And uh, the, here's a query specifically for the selected filter. And so with this, you can say that, okay, the selected filter in this state is all. We start out in all, makes sense. And here's the to-do count, which is if we look at the web, it's this one here, down here, two items left. So that makes sense. Like we're in the all, there are no to-do items. Then we focus uh, the input. We press A, we press enter, and then we're expecting to have like one, one to-do item, right? Go down here. Let's see what's going on. We have the same filters. So we're still in all, that makes sense. Uh, we have, and this is weird now, we have still uh, this new uh, to-do still has the value A, even if we've sort of gone, should, should, uh, should have a new item. And we don't have any, any list items either. So there's something going on here with timing. Uh, and I think this might take some time now again. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna check down here. Right, and this is the, the thing that I talked uh, about before. So I, I forgot to add this flag that you need to specify with uh, some of these to-do MVC applications, uh, the, the trailing state changes. So if we add that, we'll see if it works better. Uh, it's called max trailing state changes. I put two, I think it would be enough. I think this will give us a more clear behavior. This is sort of unfortunate that you have to mess around with this, but on the other hand, there's no way for Quickstream to know like how long should I wait for something to happen after clicking a button? It's, there's no, no universal answer. So you have to help it a bit with, with the stuff. And some of these frameworks, they update the DOM asynchronously. So after clicking a button, like synchronously after clicking that button, the state change to the DOM might not have taken place yet. So you might have to, to, uh, to set this uh, trailing state changes to await the, the correct state, so, so to speak. Because if nothing happens in between, Quickstrom will ignore that. There's a, I took this from, from TLA plus, there's a concept of stuttering, which means that if the state you're observing is the same many times, that's called stuttering. It's just Nothing is happening basically, uh, and when when checking if a behavior is valid in terms of your specification, it's what's what's called uh, stutter invariant, or it doesn't care about all those stuttering states. It just collapses those into one. So uh, in this case, if we if we don't uh, pick up the asynchronous change, then whatever we saw that there was a, a stutter and yeah. This, this gets a bit complicated uh, with, with the state changes, but uh, to summarize, like you might have to, to pass these parameters and, and fiddle a bit with it, depending on your application and depending on which framework you're using and, and how it's rendering to the DOM. I, I, I've not confirmed this, but I think React started using a different rendering technique based on their fibers, I think it's called. And um, basically meaning they have like some sort of asynchronous work scheduling thing going on with rendering. So uh, everything doesn't change like atomically after you've uh, updated the virtual DOM or do after you've done the the, the rendering in your application. It, it might uh, schedule things later on, which makes it complicated to test automatically like this. Yeah, I think this was a recent change to try and re remove the virtual DOM further from the actual DOM even more. Hmm. And so in this context, that gets, that makes it complicated because 
your atomic state changes aren't really atomic in the DOM anymore, right? Yes. So in this case, you, you, you might have to wait a bit for, for, for it to sort of uh, appear atomic. Uh, uh, yeah, the there's, some, case, uh, there's some testing libraries that, that kind of let you do this. Uh, I don't know if you've seen testing library, testinglibrary.com. No, um, you, can, you can kind of check for um, state changes that will eventually happen. Yeah, and it, it might be that Quickstream needs to have some sort of special support for these frameworks, in that it, because if it would, you know, observe all those intermediate same changes, which are basically just one logical state change being split up into different rendering chunks, uh, then your specification could say that, you know, that's not valid, but uh, from, from a user point of view, it would be uh, so fast so you, you couldn't observe uh, the different state changes. It, it would sort of be perceived as a single state change. I guess that's the idea. So the test framework might need to support that somehow. Let's see if this one uh, will give us a better, better trace. Sure, if we can look, look at the spec some more, but basically all these, you can see if we can find uh, a query somewhere, but all these transitions, they're basically like, um, you know, in the, the current state, something should have a value of some certain value uh, and in the next state, it should be something else. And here it's actually the current value should not be equal to the next value. So this is sort of uh, what Joe asked about before, kind of. So whatever pending text evaluates to, and I think it's a string um, or like a maybe string, that shouldn't be the same as whatever next pending text evaluates, evaluates to. It should this entire expression will also be like a maybe string. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, is it, oh, so many things. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's a string. And this string is the result of doing querying for one element of some selector and the value. And if it's available, then you know, pull out that value or just return a, an empty string. This is still going on. Are there any questions so far? I've been rambling a bit. I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Some might pop up though. Okay. Uh, I've just been enjoying the presentation. Is this the first time that you've done like a public demo of this kind? Yeah. Super fun, right? <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Uh, I, I'm I mean, happy with like, people uh, being positive about this. Yeah, I mean, I find the solution to be so elegant. I'm surprised someone hasn't thought of it before. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's good. I guess. Uh, I mean, flattering and, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of, I mean, I guess not to flatter you too much, maybe it's sort of, um, it's the, the elegance comes from the, the theory behind the approach in a sense and the solution like falls out of it in a nice way that it often, and it often happens that way with, uh, FP. Right. Right. Like pick, pick the right, DSL picks the right sort of expressiveness and, and what you want to say about something and then the, the practicalities. Yeah, you just, you just you just found a really nice unexploited use case, I guess. I think some people have used, they've done this thing with like property-based testing frameworks and model, model tests and implemented the web driver, uh, you know, implemented a test with first a model that behaves like say to do MVC and then some runner that uses WebDriver to call all the uh, 
to translate the actions that they have uh, that they have sort of coded somehow, uh, translate those into web driver commands, uh, all the queries, like all the stuff you have to do, and it achieves the same end result. It will be sort of as fast because it's the slow thing here is web driver mostly, um, but still you have to do so much work and you have to have this full functional model that describes your system. Uh, the fun thing about using a specification language like this is that you can be sort of under specifying. You can say quite little about something and still find bugs. And I find that very appealing. So I think that's like one of the major benefits here. Friend of the meetup, Joe Kachmar has a few questions. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so I went and leafed through the Quickscript repo a little bit, just because I was curious what you were talking about with the FFI earlier. Um, do you have any thoughts on like, I guess, as the project grows, presumably you would want to pull in more common library, things like that, how the FFI solution could expand into something that ends up being a um, bit more easy to extend? Yeah. Uh, so the, the current approach is, as you, as you uh, appreciate, is not very flexible. Like you, you have to go and, and modify the, the Quickstream binary, basically. Um, and like on the one hand, I don't expect these specifications to be super complicated and that you would need a lot of PureScript libraries. But then again, there might be some library that solves a thing for you. So. Yeah, who knows? And so I, I haven't really optimized for that yet, but uh, it is still, it is also painful to have to write all the FFI stuff. I've written a fair bunch of these FFI definitions already. There's a bunch more remaining. So if people stop using this, they'll probably find it uh, sooner <laughs> rather than later. Like, oh, FFI is missing for this first big function or whatever. Um, so it would be nicer to, use the Node.js backend, basically. But the good thing about uh, how I'm doing this now is that it's easier to implement the, the uh, linear temporal logic stuff and like evaluating in different states or changing the sequence of states as you go along evaluating. And if, if I can figure out some way of doing that in Node without requiring the surface language to be, you know, this say applicative or monadic type that you have to have to use, because that would be one approach to, to have like a state monad that you would, uh, you would operate in. And then when Quickstream calls the node, uh, the, the node runtime or with your specification, it would sort of run the state monad for you, something like that. Um, that would require the user to know <laughs> first how to use state monads in, in PureScript. And I don't know, I think there's a, uh, it's nice that it's, it's not quite a pure language because there are side effects sort of built in with, with next and so on, but we're not side effects, but it's not, uh, yeah, it, it, it's sort of a hack, but it's convenient. So, yeah, I was. Um, I think I was mainly thinking from the perspective of I've seen other projects that do more, uh, I'll say, aggressive or different embeddings of the PureScript language with different backends. But that's quite different from what you're actually going for here. Um, and like I said, it, it was a very open question. I was just more vaguely curious if that's something that you'd consider. I think it's you know more than reasonable that you think that this is just going to be a very direct embedded. Uh, language and that the packages you're pulling in or the foreign function interface you're pulling in are are things that you think should just be part of this domain specific language for testing. Um, yeah. One of the yeah, as you say, like the yeah, I'm just gonna the comment preview like the as you say the the other uh, more like backends for pure script kind of projects they have a very different goal as you say like they're supposed to be general purpose in some sense and you might want to use whatever packages. So, yeah. Okay, well, you had one more thing? 
Yeah, there was just th this wasn't language related at all. This is more kind of something I I I guess presented itself in my mind at the beginning of the talk. Um, it seems like the ability for you to construct this type of tool is very uniquely coupled to the fact that the DOM exists and is fostered the kind of ecosystem it has around it. Mostly because when we talk about things like model tests or state machine tests, you really do end up in a situation where someone needs to either construct their entire application around a model that they can then like really deeply probe. I think Foundation DB was the example I was reading about way back that kind of did this and it like worked very well for them. Um, or, you know, away from model tests for like state machine testing for like UI, you don't have the ability to construct these generic UI test frameworks simply because other UI paradigms don't seem to expose this type of information that the DOM does. Is there, is that sort of like an accurate take uh, in your opinion based on that we built this and worked with it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what makes this project possible or how, it, how it's working right now is, as you say, like the DOM being so, uh, it's, it's such a big focus of the DOM being introspectable and, and programmable in that sense. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of the automation that Quickstrom brings to the, like, as opposed to, to writing model-based tests, it's because the, you can do this stuff with the DOM. And people have asked like, oh, can't you do this for, you know, uh, whatever it's called on um, Apple devices, like uh, the iOS SDKs or uh, Objective-C and, and uh, Swift and so on, uh, or Android or uh, GTK maybe, or, or Qt or whatever really. It, the, the, the same idea should apply to whatever UI testing or really uh, even more generally to any sort of stateful system that you can introspect with where you can probe it or query it for like, what can I do next? And what is the current state of things? Um, so if you have those two uh, capabilities, you, sh you should be able to transfer this idea to, to testing those systems. But I don't know, I, I, I mostly like messed around with GDK and I don't think their sort of widget model is that uh, in, uh, has that support for introspection that, that you have in the DOM. I recall, so because I did like a Haskell library for, for GTK and tried doing something like that. Um, and it was really hard to get information back out of rendered widgets and so on. So it depends a lot on that introspection capability. Yeah, I think the, the takeaway that I got, I guess part of the reason why the, the very beginning um, seemed fairly significant to me, um, I guess I hadn't considered this before hearing you speak about it, was that uh, we're basically operating when we, we talk about web UI programming as a way of interacting directly with a state model. And then that gives us a lot of the abilities of what other people get out of model testing in a way that I, I, I legitimately just hadn't thought about it before. So this is a, a really, this project is very extremely cool because I have an intuition that if more people use something like this as a way to do testing for their UIs, they would be more prone to want to use model-based testing or state models in other aspects of programming, simply because this does abstract a lot of the difficulty that I think Stephen was talking earlier about UI testing. Um, yeah. So uh, very much appreciate that, especially because I had not had that thought before. It was it's very a very interesting perspective to have about uh, web programming. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm, it's sort of, by having the, the introspection, you could say if, if you look at this as state machines, then the the arrows are given to you by the DOM, basically. Where it's like Quickstream is given all the information about the transitions automatically. You don't have to do that much. Uh, you might have to constrain it a bit for, for practical reasons because you don't want to run tests forever. But still, that's like a big part of, of the work is provided by the browser in that sense. But yeah, it would be interesting to see if this idea applies to, can be transferred to other contexts, maybe other UI testing scenarios, or maybe even other state, uh, state machine testing uh, environments of some sort. Uh, any more questions right now? There is one last question. Okay. 
Um, do you want to finish with your uh, coding example right now, or should we go to the question? It's a good like final question, I think. Okay, then then I'll do this, and if I embarrass myself, then we have a good ending anyway. Okay. Let's look at this now that I've tweaked a bit. It's a pretty long one, but let's see. We can, we, let's just like happily assume that the error is in the end. So I'll, I'll scroll a bit here. We have a, like the initial state. We uh, focus, press A, and we're in a new state where A is in the input field, right? Press enter. Now start stuff is looking better. So now we have a list item with a label that's a, a to-do item where the, the text content is A. So that's our newly added thing. Uh, let's see what we have. And the input is cleared and so on. And the, the count is one. Great. We focus the, the input field again. And then it started messing around doing weird stuff. So it starts clicking a not selected filter, the second one, because this is like a zero based index of of all those that match the selector, then the second one will be clicked. Uh, okay, and then we go to the completed filter instead, like this is the second one. Uh, the item goes away because it's not completed. We click again some filter. Now we're in the active and it should be shown again, which it is. You see sort of how what's going on here. Go back to the input, press A, and I have my idea what's going to happen next. So now we have one item with, with A in it. We're in the active state. We have a pending to-do item with text A, the one, press A again for some reason. And we have AA pending. Right, and here we have the bug or problem, I should say, but I, I would probably think this is a bug. If we have a pending item, AA, and we click a filter, then we go to that filter, but we lose our pending to-do item, which is not what the specification says. And we can, we can confirm this like manually here. All right. Uh, if I have one thing, we were in the active state. I, I should have done like the full sequence, but I think I have to. I add the same thing here. And then instead of clicking enter and like adding it, I go to all and then it clears my input. And if I do this in like the react thing, which is considered to be correct. Uh, so I have some stuff here already. If I change filter while I have a pending item, it retains it for me. So this is like the, the first uh, problem that I found with Angular and this usually shows up. Uh, so this is how, how you would find a problem and how you would, you have to look at this sort of messy report. I am hoping to <laughs> improve this quite a bit to both to, to have like a big highlight over here saying like, this is where it failed. And also maybe generate an HTML report with where you can sort of fold things and, and navigate more easily. These entries aren't very easy to read either, so. I was going to say, going to say HTML say, report, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be nicer. But uh, yeah, this is what's here for now. And it does find the problem, so I guess that's good. Okay, uh, should we take the, the last question and then? Uh, yeah, and I have to read it. Have to read it. Yeah. So Adriano asks, one of the main arguments of moving from Selenium-based testing frameworks to Cypress was avoiding the common timeouts of web drivers. Did you experience any problems related to timeouts or web drivers not responding? I haven't yet, no. Um, or, well, if there is a bug in Quickstrom, uh, which I, I had, like, uh, I had some, some bug in my, uh, th there's like a small 
uh, Selenium has this as well, their own, but there's a small like client side JavaScript thing that gets, it used to get injected into the web page, but now I, I pass in functions all the time. Anyway, so if there were bugs in those, they could sort of throw an exception and I would not catch it and it wouldn't call the callback and the, the web driver action would just wait for a half a minute and then time out. Uh, this is a bug in Quicksrum, not in the spec. And once those bugs are out, which I think most of them are right now, <laughs> if Quicksrum behaves correctly, you should never experience that. No. That should, shouldn't be a problem. If that's the sort of timeout that you're talking about, I'm not sure if there are others, maybe. Adriano, do you have any follow-up? I can also just note that I haven't used Cypress uh, for for any anything. I've just looked at it a bit, and it seems like they have improved some of the, the asynchronous stuff and waiting and so on. But I think also like Selenium has done that more recently, added like utilities for uh, awaiting certain states and so on. So no follow up from Adriano. Okay. I've used Cypress. It's very nice. Hmm? I, Something like was, what you're doing, but in a Cypress style would be amazing. So what, what would we say is like the, the nice difference? Is it like the UI for reports and, and consumers? Oh, yeah, yeah. You get an actual browser and you can see what's happening. Right. Yeah, this is very like rudimentary with all the text just in the terminal. It would be nice if you had like at the very least, like screenshots with maybe highlighted markers on this is the place in the DOM where something had the incorrect state or something. Uh, but because that's with a, a specification, if you can pinpoint like this is the thing that's not correct, like this value should have been something else or whatever, then you can, then Quickstrom can automate a lot of the error reporting to be very, you know, on point what, what's, it can highlight the right thing in, in a screenshot or in a, in a browser or something like that, which I guess would be hard or harder if you have like this more general purpose programmable web browser or testing framework where you sort of write unit tests. So uh, yeah, I think like UI can be improved so much. There is a lot to do there. Uh, so yeah, definitely. P PRs are welcome, I assume. <laughs> yeah, I think some some sort of HTML report would be a nice nice first step to get get away from the terminal output here. Yeah, uh, Oktoberfest is coming up. Yeah, I'll just leave it out somewhere else. Um, I'm moving in October, so I, I hope someone can pick it up. But. Um, uh, yeah, that, that might be a good start. Maybe also like output formats for, what's the name, like XUnit, uh, error reports so you can integrate in CI and so on. Be nice. But yeah, uh, and then we'll see if there's a service or a product built on top of this app in, in some, some sunny day. I think there's a, a decent, like uh, find this as a service makes sense because you can test web apps sort of black box with this. So as long as, as you can host your, your web app somewhere and it's accessible, then uh, this could work. And uh, this is sort of what you need for a browser stack to work, I think. And maybe not Cypress, maybe you can run it locally or within your firewall or whatever, but and then you're just maintaining a specification, essentially. You're um, relieving the burden from the developer of having to write tests at all. Right, you're, you're maintaining the spec instead of a bunch of, of examples or manual, manually written tests, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a billion dollar business to me. Yeah, maybe. I, I guess the, the, the one... Uh, the, the hurdle of this is 
getting into writing these specifications. It's like a, I think it's more of a, like an educational problem maybe than technical, <clears throat> even if there is a lot of technical stuff that can be improved. But uh, well, if you're following a TDD approach, like a good developer, you're sort of doing a specification anyway, or maybe in the ideal case you are. So you might actually yeah. be enforcing best practices, um, testing in this manner. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're probably informally thinking about the specification at least in your head. And if you take the to-do MVC, they, their specification, they, this sort of one-to-one -one translatable with, with what I have, but it's more you know, checkable or formal in that sense. But yeah, but uh, then again, like property testing is something that is hard for people to get into uh, because it's hard to sort of reset and start thinking about general properties instead of specific uh, specific examples. So, but I don't know how, how, how it plays out in Quickstream. I, I haven't had many users yet, so we'll see. Well, I think discovering property-based testing for me was one of the selling points of Haskell originally. So this is the reason I wanted to invite you to give a talk here. I just think property-based testing is the way it should be done. And if there's a way to do it on the front end, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Uh, very cool what you've built and I wish you nothing but success. Thank you so much for um, choosing our group to present it to for the first time. And I hope you have many more such successful presentations in the future, Oscar. Really appreciate it. Thanks you all for, thank you all for, for coming and uh, all the good questions and, and comments. And, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for thank the great thank questions. You. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. And thank you very much, you very much one more time. Yeah, you too. Thanks for, for having me, everyone that came along. <laughs>